I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel. We're in the life of Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel 16. I want to take a look at that. Well, this is a life of Samuel. Uh, Samuel's life is so intertwined with um, the first king, Saul, that you just wind up with it. Uh, 16, 14 is where I want to start. Uh, God has rejected him as king. Therefore, in this passage, is going to remove the Holy Spirit that's been placed on him, not in him, in the Old Testament. And that's verse 14. Now, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Saul's servants said to him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Others could see that. Let our Lord now command your ser servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. Saul said to his servant, Provide me a man who can play and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a, a son of Jesse, the, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. Wow, that's how others viewed him. That's pretty good, isn't it? I'd hate to have a view... Uh, this set of me, wouldn't you? That's pretty good. That that looks like that's a kind of like in the uh, what do they call that senior book in high school? Annual uh, and an, uh, see, anyhow that senior book, and they write in there what they think about you. This is pretty much close to where he is, isn't it? At seventeen. So uh, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, "Send me your son David, who is with the flock." Boy, this guy's been anointed king, and he's still with the flock. That's humbling, isn't it? But he's just a kid. He's got to grow up. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a jug of wine and a young goat and sent him to Saul by David, his son. David came to Saul and attended him, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David now stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So it came in as he hired him. He hired him. He said, I need you, have you release him from your hired to me. So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand and Saul would be refreshed and would be well and the evil spirits would depart from him. When I was in my theological training, I've told you this, before, but when I was in my theological training, I double majored because I wound up with a bunch of credits left over from changing my curriculum, changing my degree. I didn't know what to do with these, and so I finally got me a professor, uh, an advisor, they call him, and he figured out a way that I could, I could switch them over somehow or another and, and get very close to um, a, a, a minor, close to a, a major, he thought, in psychology. I said, well, I want to do something rather than have them burn <laughs> because I was in a whole other degree. So we did that, and I only lacked a few courses to be, I had enough to get a minor, and I had enough over that if I took a few more courses, I could wind up with a major in it. And so I thought, well, I'll double major, and, and I did. I was familiar with this passage. When I got into what they called, ab back when I took it, they called it abnormal psychology. There's no such thing anymore. And that's true. But when I went, there was a difference between normal and abnormal. <laughs> 
And I really knew that abnormal group too. But uh, they did not believe uh, that there were evil spirits. They just believed it was a, a mental deal. They didn't believe that it was actually that. Of course, I did. My Bible says so. And I'm going to tell you, there were two things that we discovered when we worked at Bryce in my senior year. Some of us that were writing on a subject matter, I was really interested in abnormal psychology, and I wrote on it. I wrote a lot on it. I wrote a lot of abnormal psychology in the church and in the world. And um, I found two things that really worked with people who had mental disorders of whatever nature. Um, color and music. And not just any kind of music. But a certain kind of music and a certain kind of color affected their, their psyche. And that was very interesting to me. Uh, but I remembered that from this story here, because this is a very famous story, isn't it, in the Bible? This is a very famous story. It's misunderstood, but it's a very famous story. Well, anyhow, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll talk about this. I give you a moment of silence. As a believer priest for classroom etiquette, it's important that you understand you cannot study the Bible and get spiritual information that can change your life in, under transformation. You're supposed to be engaged in transformation and not conformity to the world, but transformity to Christ. Can't do that in carnality. Evidence of carnality in life is personal sin. The Holy Spirit, with personal sin in your life unconfessed, then it grieves him, it quenches him, brings you into conviction both by your conscience and by the Holy Spirit. And there should be awareness in your life of that. What do I do with it to get back to spirituality? You have to confess your sin. First John 1 9 says, confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That cleansing is not for salvation in verse 9. It's for salvation in verse 7. In verse 9, it's for sanctification. It is to bring the Holy Spirit that lives in you in the church age back into the powerful position of teaching you. You learn the Bible under the ministry of the Spirit and you live it under the ministry of the Spirit. And that's the, that's the key. So, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come uh, our way, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth tonight about this evil spirit from the Lord. What does that mean? Uh, we know that this man is a believer. It's been evidenced up to this chapter. So what is that, and, and, and how is that affecting his life? Tonight, Father, we, we seek information from the Word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to make clarity to us in Jesus' name, amen. Now here's the passage, and I want to show it to you because there's some key things here that you cannot see in the English. You cannot see in the English. For example, it's at the very top of your paper. The very top of your paper. Now I gave you some vocabulary words because I have some people here in the Hebrew class, but the word spirit, rock. See that? R U. And then an A and a C-H. See that? Ruach. The Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit of the Lord, departed, Cal perfect, Cal perfect, from. Now in the English, notice the two words from. Just circle those for a moment. Circle them in your paper because I want to talk about them. See, in the English, it just says from. But in the Hebrew, I wrote these out. They're what we call, com this is a double preposition. There's two prepositions in the word from. And listen, notice the first from, uh, the Holy Spirit departed, uh, 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 the Holy Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Now look at the word from. See the first one? Just look at the letters and the, and the dots underneath it. See the first one? Do you see the second one? You can see there's a difference. Do you right? You can see there's a difference. Right? There are two different words here. Now, th there are two prepositions. There's the word M, that, that M-E, 
that's there, it, it, that's that first letter there that looks like that. That's ME. And see, it's on the, it's on the part of both of them. That's, that's the preposition from. Then notice that you have, that's the first preposition, and then you've got the, the two other ones. Those are prepositions. Those are prepositions. Now, in the first one, you have this. Uh, is that an M on the end? Yes. Okay. An M. There's your first one, right? And, and, and let me tell you what the first one, this, this is a normal way if you're going to emphasize something big, you double it up. This is not the only place you're going to find this in the Bible. You'll find it all over the Bible. That's, that's a double preposition. That's a double preposition. And when it's there, it is to expand information. It is to, to give you, it, it's something big is going on. Because you double the preposition. You don't, you don't normally do that unless you stutter. So th this is a really big deal. All right? Now, in the, in the first one, this, this one is normally used this way to, when you're emphasizing something big happening after a verb of leaving or departing. All right? And, of course, we have that. The Holy Spirit is departing, Cal perfect. The perfect tense in the Hebrew means completed action. He's going to leave and he's not coming back. Okay. And, and the Cal perfect. From here, in doubling the preposition, it means from belonging to. It means from belonging to. And it's after a verb of departing. The Holy Spirit departed from Saul. He's departed in Cal perfect. He used to belong to the Spirit of the Lord was given to Saul on the basis of grace for a ministry, right? Because he was king. Not because he was saved, but because he had been called to a special assignment. That's Old Testament. And, and, he, and because of the Lord who was sovereign over where the... Old Testament, then that spirit of the Lord belonged to the Lord and was loaned out to Saul. That deal's done. It's a big deal in the plan of God. That's a big deal. And he doubled it up to show you. That's a big deal. And he put the cow perfect. Then that's the first one. That's connected with the I'm going to put it, the Spirit of the Lord, okay? That's the first time. The second time, we have an evil spirit, and that's R-A-A-H, uh, evil, and, of course, the spirit is the same, Ruach. And this time, this time, we have the, the from on the front of it, but notice we have a different preposition on the back side um, with two E's. I mean, with an E, okay? I have two on the M2, yeah. All right? Now, you can see, and this is the evil spirit of the Lord. Agreed? So what the Bible says, and, and it is exactly what it means. And this one has been sent to te terrorize them. Actually, this word that I gave you, bath, in the Hebrew means to fall upon, a and it, but it, it can mean terror, uh, terrorize. Um, and it's going to manifest itself in, uh, in Saul, it's going to manifest itself in what we'd call a form of insanity. And it won't be there all the time, but it'll come upon him, and he'll get nuttier and a fruitcake. Okay? And you can see this pattern in his life. Now, with this word, with this, with this doubling of this preposition, uh, and both of these prepositions over here is, if you're in the Hebrew and you look at both of these, both of these are going to say with. 
but they have a little different meaning with what it means to be with. This one, this last one, the evil spirit from the Lord, if you, if you study this word in the Hebrew, it's dealing with proximity, proximity, or, or proceeding from, proximity or proceeding from. And, and listen, the emphasis of this preposition is origin, where it originated, where it originated, okay? And where it originated is expressing someone who has authority, somebody with authority, and that is the Lord. Both the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit are under the authority of the Lord. The Lord's authority. That's what we just got. That's, that's the changing up of those right there. Okay? That's why the word Lord is with both of them. Now, the question in this, okay, I, I understand what this says, Ron. I understand what it says. And notice that terrorizing is in the PL. That's the intensive stem. That, and it's a perfect tense. And that's not going to change either. That's completed action. Okay? Now, what, what we have to determine is what, what is the meaning of an evil spirit. Do you understand? Because this word spirit, ruach, is used many ways in the Hebrew. It's used a lot of different ways. And context has to determine it. So the question that we have to solve tonight is what is this evil spirit? Because listen, it dominates our passage. The word evil spirit is in verse 14. You didn't pay any attention when we went through. But it's in verse 14. Look down there. Do you see it? It's in verse 14. It's in verse 15. Agreed? It's in verse 15. It's in verse 16. And it's verse 23 two times. Do you see the two times in 23? See, that's dominating the passage, isn't it? And so, you know, those of us who study this stuff, we look for markers. What's being, what is dominating a passage? And this is certainly dominating this, this passage about Saul. There was a change in Saul's life. One moment, this guy was elevated into the spiritual, and in the next moment, he's down on the bottom of the heap. You understand what I mean? Okay, so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to answer the question, what is this evil spirit from the Lord? Okay, so I'm going to give you four points on it because this evil spirit is terrorizing Saul and every time it terrorizes him, he terrorizes ter ter terrorize everybody who's in his six feet. Agreed? If you read the rest of Saul's life, when he is under the evil spirit's influence, you better not be in his six feet. I mean, David, no matter how much David, David was a, not only a warrior to him, he was a top, the top medic in his life, right? And he threw a spear at him twice, tried to nail him to the wall, man. <laughs> and think who was throwing that other than Saul. I think it was throwing that spear. Ah, uh, boy. So here's point number one. The first thing we're going to answer is that it's not God. It, yeah, but Ron, it says the evil spirit from the Lord. Yeah, but what it says, it says the evil spirit that's under the authority of the Lord. That's what it actually says. All right? Now, here's the doctrinal principle that it's not from God. Listen, here's, here's what the Bible makes clear. God will not tempt with evil, nor is he tempted by evil. It is contradictory to the essence of holiness. 
there's one thing that's consistent about God. It's his essence. And out of holiness comes goodness that man can understand. For example, when he created the world and he gets through summarizing, he looks back and the, seven, and the six days of creation, he says, it's very good. You know why? Because it's his work absolutely 100%. Paul picked that up in Timothy when there was a conflict with the Jews about what they could eat and not eat in the church. They'd come to church and pick on what the, pick pick on their 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 foods. Try to make an issue out of it. And Paul brings this brings up Genesis 1:31 and tells them that listen in 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 cry in God in Christ there is no such thing as as there, there might be rotten food, but there's not unclean. Because God, when he got through with it, this is what he says. And so he says, in Christ, this is true. So you need to read uh, Genesis 131 on your own one day, and then look up 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. That's, that's what you pray about. When you, listen, you, you know, you bow, you bow your head and have a word of prayer. Look, I'll go. let's go to Timothy. Let's go to Timothy a moment. Let's go to Timothy 4, 4, 4. He, he, he's talking about uh, doctrines of demons in the church in verse 1. And he says uh, they're bad because uh, they affect the conscience. Uh, and, they've, and then he deals with uh, their, their, their forbidding marriages and foods and and, and verse 3, which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. And then he goes on, he says, for everything, this is because we're in a church age, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. And attitude is, a, is an attitude of grace. The appreciation for grace. It is sanctified, the food, by graced. We, that's why we call it, let's, let's pause and give grace for our food, right? That's what we used to call it. Uh, for it is sanctified, set apart, set apart unto holiness, set apart by means of the word, not the law. See, that, that's, a, that's why we give thanks uh, before we eat. Okay? Now, this concept of God is good has just come up recently with us in Genesis 50, 20 in our study. You meant what you meant for evil, God has meant for good. You know why? Because of Romans 8, 28. It worked back there too. All things work together for good. In Matthew 19, 17, when Jesus has, it has been as, it, as in a discussion with what we call the rich young ruler, Jesus confronts him and says, he called him good master, and he challenged him by why he would call Jesus good master uh, to see if he understood why he said good master. Jesus reminds him, as a Jew, there is only one that is good, and that is God. Are you, are you saying that? Well, he wasn't, as the story goes on. He was using it out of context. He, he, Jesus was hoping he was using it in context, that he understood that Jesus was the Son of God, that God and Jesus were equal because of the miracles and the power he had. But that's not what he was saying as you go on and read the rest of the story of the rich young ruler. But my point is, is the word that he used. Okay. So we have in James 1, 13 through 15, let no man say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each man is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. When lust has conceived, he gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth te death, temporal. And if it's not corrected, then it brings forth death, the sin unto death, 
1 John 5, 16. Okay. Will he go to heaven? If he's saved, he will. Right? We're assuming he is. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, Jesus is tempted by the devil, right? This is a very famous passage. It says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. See that? It's similar to what's happening to Saul. Similar. Just to give you an idea. It is interesting when you read this account of the temptation of Christ by the devil that in verse, the fourth chapter, verse 3, it says he, the devil is called the tempter. He, that's a title he's given. And it says the tempter came. Now, we know it's Satan. We know it's the devil. But he's called the tempter because he, he's, listen, and who's permitted this? God. The devil can't do anything without permission to any, any person in the inner circle of the divine dinosphere of salvation. Can't do it. So the tempter came, and then he go through the, it goes through the warfare, and Jesus whips him with one arm tied behind him. Why? Do you know why? Because the word of God does all the work, people. You don't need both hands to whip the devil, but you do need the word of God. Yeah. In verse 11, this story stops. It says the devil left him and the angels, that is the good angels, the elect angels, they came and began to minister to him. Ooh, uh. You see how God, listen, he had, a whole, he had a whole system of people sitting on the sideline watching it. And he says, as soon as, soon as Jesus' hand is raised as the victor, we're going to meet every need he has. We're going to pamper him, and we're going to celebrate because he just won a great victory. Imagine what they did when he, when he won it at the cross. And I'll tell you how great it was because every, every time a person believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the whole choir comes out and sings hallelujah or what amazing grace. I don't know what they sing, but I know they're pretty happy. They celebrate. This is, this is really good stuff. You just have to understand the background. Later in Matthew, the 16th chapter, we're told, that the, the thinking system of Satan that we call cosmos diabolicus, the world thinking system, Jesus said to Peter that Satan is using you to be a stumbling block to me. Which, listen, when you in a relation with somebody and you realize they're a stumbling block to your spiritual growth, What are you going to do? Get rid of them. Well, look, look, that's, that's, that's what typical people do. But is that what Jesus did with Peter? No, 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 he didn't. He, he continued ministering to him. Right? All the way to the cross. And in the end, who won? Jesus won. But most of us don't want to stay in the fight. Most of, most of us don't understand that the way you win is your hands tied behind you so that you're forced to use the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. See, we always want to bail. We always want to run. We always get in flight because we're operating by fear not stand our ground and fight the good fight of faith. Finish the course because we will win in the end. When Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, he didn't say it that Peter should do that. He's saying, Peter, listen what he said, get behind me, Satan. He didn't say, get him out of your life. He said, get him out of mine. 
You're not listening to me. Come on now. See, we always want to tell them to get it out of them because it's, a, it's me messing me up. Jesus did tell them that. You have better come a stomach block to me. But he's addressing that the problem is not me and you. It's the problem between my relationship with God and your relationship with Satan. They're not compatible. See, that's at, that's at 2 Corinthians 6. He says to him, you are a stumbling block to me. And then he tells him how that works. He says, you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on your own, on man's. See that? And listen, if, if, if you love Jesus, and I know you do, and if you want to grow in the word, and I know you do, you're going to have this quite a bit in your life even in your own home. It could be a mate. It could be children. It could be neighbors, in-laws, outlaws, all these kind of people connected to your life. Jesus didn't tell Peter to leave his inner circle, and Jesus didn't leave his. He said, we've got a problem. Let's clean it up. And here's how you clean it up. Your interest is on the world, and it's a stumbling block to me. You need to get your interest. You need to set your mind on God. How about that? Now, don't you know that was a shock for Peter to hear that? Because I'm sure of all the people in his inner group, he thought, Peter thought that he was about as close to God as one man could get. And, and, and listen, how was he a stumbling block? J listen, Jesus said to Peter, listen to the God of plan for my life. I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be charged with capital crime. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to be dead. And on the third day, I'm going to be raised from the dead. Peter went hogwash. Hogwash. That's a farming term. That's a farmer talking. Hogwash. And that's, J Jesus says, Peter, if you're going to walk with me, you're going to have to change your view because that's where I'm walking. I'm going to walk from Matthew 16 into 26, 27, and 28. If you're going to walk with me, that's where my walk is, son. If you're going to walk with me, that's where my walk is going. And, you know, that doesn't dawn on Peter until his resurrection. And Peter remembers his word. Oh, he remembers his rebuke when the rooster crowed, but he didn't get back to the program until the resurrection. Listen, was it worth working with Peter? <laughs> we must not sell people short just because they're short. Paul talks about this very thing in Colossians 3 about setting your mind. We talk a lot, about, a lot about it around here. Set your mind on things above, not on things below. Not on. Not on. Not on. Not on things below. What are things below? Tribulation. Huh? What is it? John 16, 33. It says, in the world you will have tribulations. Be of good courage. I've overcome the world. Huh? Is that it? Is that John? I always get Matthew and John mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. So... You know, if, when you read that Colossians, you know what, what he goes on to say? Now, he talks about setting your mind. 
that, I love that word setting because I grew up with everybody setting your clock to be on time and setting your clock to do this. And say, I love that. So the setting of your mind makes so much sense to me because I grew up with that. But you know what he, you know how, you know how he, this starts out and in, 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 this is how it starts out Colossians 3, 1, 1 and 2. But you know where it winds up? Listen, my life is hidden. Listen to what he says. My life is hidden with Christ in God. You hear those two prepositions? My life, I set my mind on things above because my life, I've, I've chosen, I've chosen this. My life, my life is hidden with Christ in God. That's a powerful idea. Do you know that? I mean, somewhere you ought to wake up every morning. That's, that, that ought to be on a plaque somewhere where you can read that first thing in the morning. And, and then keep it there when you go back, go back to bed that night and say, wow, my life was hidden in, with Christ in God this day. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Here's the second thing. So we know it's not God. We know this is not, a God, this is not God doing this. Evil spirits, here, now listen to me, evil spirits are demons who are disembodied fallen angels. You don't hear about them until after the flood. They operate under Satan's dominion. They operate under Satan's dominion. Okay? In other words, he, he's the commanding general of them. You can read this in John 12, 31. 14.30 and 16.11 where he's called the ruler of this world. That's due to Adam's fall. In John 17.5, he's called the evil one. Jesus in his prayer to the Father calls him the evil one. Uh, 17.15, 17.15. Uh, that same idea is carried by John into 1 John 3.12 and 5.19, where, where Satan, the ruler of the world, is called the evil one. Okay? And you, you'll recall that 1 John 3.12 is, where, is uh, where Cain murders Abel. That's that deal. And, and, and Satan promotes that, okay? In Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 11 and 12, we are told that the, the demonic army that, I'm talking church age now, post-Diluvian post, uh, post civilizational period, that they have an, uh, an army, and Paul talks about it in army terms when he call, he says they're... they're their, their forces are like this. They're called rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, and spiritual forces uh, of wickedness in heavenly places. Okay? In other words, he has a highly organized military outfit. That, that's in this passage of put on the full armor of God and do combat. That's why Paul is doing this. Now, I want you to go to with me in the 8th chapter of Luke. And this is a very famous story, and I know you're very familiar with it. The demoniac. I know you're very familiar with this story. And so I just want to hit a little bit. Uh, 26. Um. Jesus shows up, this is on the other side of Galilee, uh, of the lake, and he comes to the land, and he meets this man, this man comes out, and notice he's possessed with demons, and in, as Jesus encounters him, asks him what his name is, and his, he says his name is Legions. He, he's a commander, listen, and we know, we, we know um, 
the guy that was over that whole group, well, it, 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 I, I don't want to get that deep in it. Uh, but anyhow, um, his name is Legions. And, and he talks about this guy. The guy, guy calls out. And, and the demon talks to Jesus in verse 28. And, and listen, notice how it looked this now in verse 20 now. I want you to see this closely now. Look how, how, Jesus, how that demon, and these are demons now. Look how they're identified. Now, they're, they're called demons, and we know they're legions because there are a lot of them, right? We know they're, they're and we, that's, a, that's a military term, right? That's a military, listen, not only is it a military term, listen, it's a, a prominent, historic, it's a, it's an update military term, right? I mean, it's, it's prevalent to the culture and the time in which he's living, I mean, if it was another culture and another thing, he would call it something else. This is Roman. All right. All right. Now, watch in verse 29 that, that for he has been commanding, watch this, the unclean spirit. Now, this is a demon. And you know why? He's, listen, you know, and this is a demon, right? We know this guy's got legions. He's got all of them are classified unclean. You know where that comes from? Jewish culture. This comes from Jewish culture. And you know why they're unclean? And you know why that, listen, do you know why this man is where he is doing what he's doing? Where's he living? At, at tombs. He's living in a graveyard. And you know what that is? That's unclean to the Jews. These are unclean spirits. And when, and when he cast him out, what's he go into? Pig and pigs are unclean. This, these th these demons are operating under under two concepts. They're both they're both prevalent in the culture of their time. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Do I? <laughs> Deviled ham. <laughs> Deviled ham. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Well, listen. And listen, he, he, he's powerful in all that, right? I mean, the Lord, he, I mean, he, this one guy goes in there and takes on the legion of them, uh, throws them, listen, you're a bunch of unclean. I mean, this is funny in the spiritual realm. He, he says, he put, your unclean spirit says, only one place you could go. Here are the pigs. That makes so much sense. Well, of course not. Of course not. Think about this guy that's trying to handle it. He's not earning a fruitcake. Listen, these are evil spirits. These are evil spirits. They're demons. And listen, it depends on what the demon is doing is how he's identified. In this, the demons are identified as unclean spirits. <laughs> you always pay attention to that stuff when you're reading about them. Demons came to existence after the flood of the antediluvian civilization. You can read about this. And this is well worth your read, not tonight, but on your own. It's 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. This is where Jesus goes and speaks to him uh, when he goes into Sheol. This is their part of Tatarus, which is part of Sheol. 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, Jude 6. In Revelation 9, 1 through 12, the, the chief military commander of that whole uh, time of Noah's flood is identified in Revelation, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 12. In the Hebrew, his name is Abanan, in Greek, Apollon. He's, he's identified. He's going to be, listen, he and that whole group are going to be released in, in the tribulation. I mean, Wow. 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5 says, For if God did not spare angels, see, they're called fallen angels then. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, that's fallen angels versus elect who didn't, but sent them to hell, Sheol, and committed to pits of darkness, to Tarsus, reserved for judgment, Matthew 25, 41, the lake of fire, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. 
in 1 Peter 3.19, these fallen angels of Genesis 6 through 9 are called spirits in prison. Okay? All right, we're moving along. Number three. However, Satan and the demonic world must operate. Listen, they don't have free reign. Satan and the demonic world must operate under God's sovereignty of the plan of God. Now, we learn this from the book of Job. That's where we learn this. The life of Job makes this doctrinal point in the first and second chapters. In chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, God, in the, in the conference between the devil and the supreme conference is allowed to come in from roaming to and fro on the earth, he shows up and the Lord boasts of Job. Now, what's he roaming to and fro? He's finding, he's finding believers that are having impact on his, on his world, and he's trying to shut them down. But he can't, he can't do that. He's tried to... He has already tried different ways to shut it down, and he couldn't because God had a hedge around him and was blessing him out of the wazoo, whatever the wazoo is. <laughs> and the reason, the, how does God boast about him? He boasts of him in front of Satan. He boasts of him. He, he, he just rubs his nose in it. He says, he's blameless, upright, fears God, and turns away from evil. Satan says, I'll take that last one. I'll take that last one. I don't give a rip about the other three. I don't think they matter. It's, see how stupid he is? Those three don't make, if he don't have the first three, the last one has, any, has no purpose in him. He could do that by law and be defeated every day. Listen, turn away from evil. Satan, Satan, I got it. Turn from evil. <laughs> He'll turn into evil. Yeah, get, let me have him. I'll turn him into e evil. So the game's on. Satan, in, the, in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, rebukes. He, he gives a rebuttal, a rebuttal. He says to him, he says to God, well, big deal. J Job doesn't fear God for nothing. You've put a hedge around him and you've blessed him out of the wazoo. I mean, he's getting payback for it. See how he thinks? Oh, boy, you need to understand how he thinks. And then listen what he says. Listen, turn from evil. That's because, that's because you won't let me have a fair shake at him. Let me at him. I, listen, he won't turn from evil. He'll turn into evil. See, that's his purpose. This is what, and here's what he says he'll do. And when I'm through with him, he'll curse you to your face. Every man has a price. Yeah, that's what he thinks. Yes, he does. Yeah, but listen, here's the Christian. And, and listen, if you think that way, you're dead in the water. You've got to understand that the price has all been, already been paid on the cross. The price has already been paid. You've already been bought. You can't be bought again. Whoa. He, Satan says to God, he will surely curse you in your face. So the game's on. And so the first temptation, Job's first temptation, verse, chapter 1, verses 12 through 22. And boy, does it get on. And, it, and, here's how it, and here's how round one stops. It says, through all of this, devil, the devil wrenched it up on him. And through all of this, listen to me, Job did not sin with his lips. What sin would that be? Curse God. Curse God. That's what the devil, that's what he said I'm going to get him to do. I'm going to get him. I'm going to turn him into evil, not from evil, into evil, and he will curse you in your face. Game's on. Round one. There is ha in heaven. 
Round one. What's how is it going? Job didn't sin. Hoo-ha! Second chapter, verses nine and ten. We get into round two. Second chapter, one through ten. And boy, does he wrench it up on him. Round two. He says, okay. He's not, he's not a guy who's hung up on details of life. Listen to me, that's important. Here's Satan's two great wars. Details of life, get after you, take everything you got. And then the second one is life itself. Details of life first, life itself second. You hear me? You better be listening. This war still goes on. And so the game is on. Now, you see, he's not after. He, he, he's after all the stuff that God blesses your life with. And listen, you know what complaining says? That when you complain to God about what all he's doing to you, it says you have no appreciation for what you have with him. I don't want my job. I don't want my wife. I don't want my kids. I don't want my car. I don't want my kids. I don't want this. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Where's this negative idea come from? That the things God has given you by your own choice, God has given you is not enough. Well, his wife, his wife says to him, why do you hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Suicide. Curse God and die. That's yeah. The definition of sure it is. You know why she said that? I'm going to tell you in a moment. Listen, here's what you need to have. You need to have Romans 14.8. Write this down. It's not on your paper. Write this verse down. Memorize that verse. If we live, we live for Christ. If we die, we die for Christ. Therefore, whether we die or live, it's all about the Lord. Okay? Better get that one down. Better get that one down. Because you see, when you're, when, when, when you're living and you're complaining, you're not living for the Lord. What do you mean what he's given you is not sufficient? I thought, I, listen, I thought, I thought God's grace is sufficient. How is it possible it's not? Because it's not meeting your expectations because you've got a false assumption that has led you to a false interpretation that's led you to a false expectation, that's led you to a false application. We learn that from Job, from the book of Job. Satan believes this, that under enough, enough adversity of undeserved suffering, Job will cave. That's what he believes. He believes what he started out to prove that he will curse you to your face. But the question is, did, did Job cave? Did Job cave? You know what the second chapter, verse 10 says? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Do you know how this thing's going to end? Of course you do. You've read the end of the book. He's not going to cave. Let me tell you how bad it got, and he never caved. Let me show you how bad it got. Now, you can read this later. I want to read Job, but I want to read Job to you. Uh, the second chapter, I want to read two verses, and then this starts it off, and it only gets worse. 
Listen to this. Here's, here's how, this is the second testing, and here's how this thing is swinging out. I'm looking at verses 13 and 14, second chapter. No, it can't be, it can't be 13 and 14. Ain't got that many. Job, the second chapter. Well, let's just do 11, let's do 12 and 13. Eh. 13, 14. Uh, yeah, 12 and 13. And, and when they lifted their eyes at a distance, they did not recognize Job. They raised their voices and wept. Let, look, at this has just started. We got a whole book to go through. This thing is going to this thing is going to be wild until we get to chapter 42 or something like that. They didn't recognize Job. They raised their voices and wept. Each of them tore their robes. They threw dust over their heads towards the sky. They sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights with no one speaking a word for him, for they saw that his pain was very great. We're in chapter 2. When we get to chapter 7, and so on, on that paper it should be 12 and 13, not 13 14. When we get to chapter 7, verse 5, it says that his flesh is covered with worms. They're eating him alive. When we get to, when we get to verses 13 and 16, his pain is unbearable. When we get to chapter 13, verses 14 through 16, Everything is wrenched up even more. And listen to what Job says. Now we're in thir chapter 13 and we're under enormous pain. And the Bible says, he says, though he slay me, I will keep my hope in him. Don't you love that? Don't you know the devil just, don't you know he's grinding his teeth? He's not going to have his teeth time he gets through with Job. <laughs> He's going to grind them all down. In chapter 16, verses 6 through 8, it says that Job has shriveled up as a ghost of the man, and you can see his bones. He's a skeleton of a man. In chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, it says that his entire family can no longer come and see him because they just can't handle it. All of his family don't come by and see him anymore. They just can't handle it. In verses 17, in, in chapter, that's chapter 19. In verses 17 through 20, it says that his breath was offensive to his wife. I mean in the room, not up close. I'm talking about step into the room where he is. His breath will take your breath away. Listen, this guy is really being had. You know what verse 25 says? Oh, I tell you, this guy is the devil nuts. He hates the word of God come from your lips. He wants you curse God. He doesn't want you to praise him. Listen to verse 20. Yet I know that my Redeemer liveth. And let me tell you, from that point on, he is kicking it out of the ballpark. The devil just is pulling his hair out. What am I going to do with this guy? I got, I got nothing left to throw at him. I got nothing left. I'm in chapter 19, and he's got nothing left. He's thrown everything. He's thrown the dishpan at him. And Job ra raised it. Right there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer liveth. You're not going to get a curse out of my mouth for Jesus Christ. Never get it out of me. Never get it out of me. Never, ever, ever. Because I know 
who my Redeemer is, and He is worthy to be praised. What is wrong with us? Sit around and moan and groan. Have no, have no praise in the midst of our adversity. Have no praise. Listen, this guy is in the midst of it, and all he's got to do is praise God. Praise God. He turns from evil, not into evil. He turns from it because he praises God. Listen, just bring it on. I don't care. Bring it on. If it's the best you got, it's not enough. And you got the big boy. He's got the big boy. He don't have some low, low level PFC. He got no somebody. He ain't got. He ain't even got a legion. He's got the man with all the forces of hell behind him. Oh, this is some more kind of a guy. I mean, how bad does it get? Listen, never bad enough for me not to lift my hands to heaven and praise my Lord. Never, never does it get that bad. Never does it get that bad. Oh, I wish you'd understand that. Wish you'd understand that. Now, in my final point today, I want, oh, man, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Oh, shoot a rooter. I'm out of time. I'm going to come back with this next time. I'm going to come back with it because you got to understand how he operates. You, you need number four bad because you need that. I mean, you got you, you to gotta understand how he operates, how he runs his reconnaissance to know how to attack you. And that's going to be very important. And I'll beef number four up. I'll, I'll make that third go for us, but I've ran, ran out of time. But not, listen, not out of the Lord's time, was it? Uh, I mean, my expectations was four, and he went shut it down. So I'm going to shut it down. But we won't be back next week, but we'll be back following week. So I'll have another week to rev this up. <laughs> so we'll, we'll come back to four, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for these who have come with us by automobile and Internet. We know the devil, he is the ruler of the world, but Job tells you how to beat him. Jesus tells you how to beat him. And Jesus beat him on the cross. <laughs> beat him on the cross. The devil thought he had him. Yeah, the, he is so dumb. He thought he had him, and up from the grave he arose. And then the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, is placed in every believer because of it. <laughs> oh, man. oh, Father, you are so magnificent. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are, you are the real deal, aren't you? I mean, Job teaches us under, under all circumstances, flip that thing. Flip that thing to God. I don't care what you're going through. What adversity? Flip it to God. There's great ministry in it. There, there, you'll see God work in the midst of adversities in a way that you would have never seen him work in your life in a special way. And that special way is so important to each of us. Now, we look at Job and say, oh, Lord, I hope mine is not like But Listen, it'll be specially for us. Satan, when we study the reconnaissance he does on believers, especially spiritual mature believers, believers that God boasts about, <laughs> he runs reconnaissance on them. He figures out a strategy to beat them, just like he did Job, to and fro. He studied Job. Oh, he said, yeah, I've looked at your man. I've run reconnaissance on him. You got a hedge around him. Yeah, I got him. Yeah, you bless him. Shoot, take all that stuff away. Pull that hedge and those blessings. He'll curse. He'll curse you to your face. Thank you, Jesus. He didn't. Thank you. What encouragement that is to us. He didn't. He held to his integrity to God. Blameless, upright. A reverence for God more than life itself. A reverence for God that's greater than the life itself. Fight evil. Don't let it have any, any place. Don't give it a door of opportunity like Ephesians 4.27. Don't give it a door of opportunity. Father, we don't want to give them a door of opportunity at all. Let them run reconnaissance on us. 
Our God is greater. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name we've prayed. Amen.